Uh, we're here at Bird and Beckett Books in San Francisco. My name is Denise Sullivan, and we're back again for an SF Lives live talk Sunday morning, April 14th. I'm here with uh, author and a uh, man of many lives, a professor, scientist, and activist, poet, uh, David Kubrin. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure to wake up and be alive, uh, I would say, here in San Francisco, uh, given what we're looking at across the world and sometimes even in our own backyard. Very much so. Yeah. Want to say something about what we were talking about off, off uh, mic before we got started? I've been living in dread of a possible World War III for weeks, and you know, watching the trajectory of the mentality and the, the genocidal will, and and last night seemed to have crossed the border. Okay, well, thanks for bringing us back to Earth, because that's really what it's about, you know? Um, and and you have devoted a lifetime, I would say, studying um, the human condition and systems and us operating within these. Basically, I'll cut to the chase, your book, uh, Marxism and Witchcraft, which uh, was published in 2021, 2020. 2020. Okay. I know we spoke in. It in, has 2020 in 2020. Vision. That's right. 2020 vision. Yeah. It kind of crystallizes this idea. And, and I'll let you elaborate, but this is my take that, like, pretty much everything in the industrialized world and all the systems that support that uh, are ultimately, ultimately lead to annihilation and destruction of all life. Um, and we'll get into the, the fine print, but um, you published for this book when you were 81, I believe. Sounds right. Right, so that is a lifetime of, of study and experience uh, leading to your, your conclusions. But what I want to stress is that today we're gonna get into um, not so much the problem with the systems, because uh, those of us who study and care are familiar with the problems. They're all around us. We want to talk about some of the solutions uh, and a, a ways toward repairing the earth that uh, we have uh, systematically uh, destroyed. <laughs> okay. So um, it, before we, we, we get into the, the heft of the book and, and what we convened here for today, I just want to talk a, a bit about your background in um, academia and science and, and the course that led you to um, resist those systems that you uh, ultimately left and turned your attention elsewhere. Uh, can, shall we start uh, with your young life in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles? Uh, <laughs> and my brother will never forgive you for saying Boyle Heights. It was my teenage years were in Beverly Hills High School. So oh. your BH was misplaced. <laughs> anyway, I want to cut to the chase because I don't want to deal so much with how I got there, although Understood. it's interesting. I was in London in 1970 on a Guggenheim grant to do research into Newton's, Newton's metaphysics. And I was a new leftist. I was an anti-war activist. I was a civil rights uh, voter registration in Tennessee. And I, you know, since since high school. Uh, and I was a child of the 60s. And I was in London studying Newton's um, background. And um, I was also watching the progression of the right wing reaction against the 60s as the think tanks, tanks began to multiply and the systems began to coalesce. And in parallel, I watched that happening and I was studying what happened in England at the onset of the mature scientific revolution under Newton. And I began to see parallels. And I was on, a, I think it was a psilocybin trip one day, and I went back to my flat, 
to get something to drink. And there was this illustration. I was going to save it till later. Can you see this? Yeah, it's a picture that Blake, William Blake made of Isaac Newton, and it shows his contempt for Newton, who is sitting with his back to a rock that's alive, like those of us who have done psychedelics, we know this vision of everything just crawling with energy. And um, Newton has his back to that and is facing a geometrical abstraction. At the time I saw this, I was also studying Newton's alchemy. And I knew that what Blake did not know, that was in Newton's manuscripts, not his published writings, how he secretly thought the world was alive and that it was key to his whole cosmology. And it came to me in a flash, the origins of our ecological crisis, the pursuit of deadness by capital, the, the whole way the system worked. And it was terrifying because I saw all this, but I could not explain all this because I don't know law, theology, philosophy, uh, economics. It impacts everything, everything, everything. Um, as a simple illustration, somewhere in here. Yeah, here it is. Here is the model of organization. I don't know whether it's worldwide. It certainly is US-wide, and I'd say certainly European. Any organization, be it an NGO, an ecological organization, a teacher's union, an educational system, a nonprofit a corporation, this is how it's set up. With a sole leadership and all the things under it, in subordinate roles. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are aware of the recent research on mycelia and the way they tie together every living thing within their ecosystem and play this fundamental magical role as intermediary between life and death, my crude drawing of the way nature is organized. But in a uh, very quick thing, Newton knew that nature was alive. He could not say so for very clear political reasons. Because that was magical, and magic was verboten at that point in time because it was connected with the indigenous cultures and the Americas that colonialism was having its Im impact, gentle word for atrocities that colonialism was having its claws into. And magic was verboten because of the witches, which was basically, it wasn't a witch hunt war of imaginary creatures. It was a war of terror on women within Europe at the hands of the church. But it went beyond the church. It went to the Protestant countries too. It was a war of terror against women for very important political reasons. Magic was also the basis of the indigenous elsewhere that colonialism was having an impact, a contact with. That was popular culture. Most terrifyingly, as Sylvia Federici has brought out, I mean, there's this whole history from below and we're discovering things that they didn't tell us in college or high school. There were thousands of rebellions as the early modern period began to carve out its imprint on humanity. You know, rivers were being ruined. Streams were being ruined. Meadows were being ruined. People were being enslaved. There was a, a, 
a new oceanic trade which had never existed. And plantation agriculture was suddenly the basis of, of a whole economy. And all the, the nation state was beginning to, to form with the, the notion of the modern notion of sovereignty. And a ratcheting up of the war on women through the, the witchcraft wars and um, yeah, land land ownership. And at the basis of all this was, of course, extractivism, mm. which was the motor force of capitalism, the motor force of the whole thing. And, I, and just, we, we have to maybe walk some of this back because uh, I know that we'll have some listeners who aren't familiar with some of the terms and some of us are, um, are and some of us may be, uh, making some leaps to put the pieces together, but extractivism isn't really a, a term that's in my vocabulary. Mm, but okay. I do understand that that would um, imply stripping the world of all of its resources, uh, 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 exploiting workers, uh, poisoning them in the process. Is that kind of the idea? Absolutely. Okay. And somewhere, well, you've all seen that graph of modernity. You know, and I have one of coal production out of England during the century from 1580 to 1680, basically, and it's that familiar curve. And capital was based, capitalism, the new economic system that was driving the world economy, was based on extracting, whether it's pelts, coal, or human labor, uh, trees, you name it, rivers, water, it was all up for grabs if you could make a buck or a peso or, or you know, whatever. Okay. So we're into the late stages, the hyper uh, stage of this at this point. You know, we're, we're in a crisis. Um, and I guess, um, you know, given your age and the eras that you've seen and lived through, <clears throat> you've watched it happen over and over, you watch the es escalation. And you came from the era of mind-expanding drugs that help you see things a little bit more clearly. Today, I think it's safe to say that we have young people who um, are more skeptical. They've, uh, and, and I, I just, I would say that this process of decolonizing the mind has already begun, and we have some folks that are up to speed with your concepts, and these are our people, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that, that, that um, there are people who are doing the work, and, and that, that one of the points that you're making is that this is an inside job as well as an outside societal community effort. So we can't do one without the other. Absolutely. Okay. And the, and I just want to go back to the the um, concept of the mycelium and the um, the earth and how things are connected. I mean, um, the consumerist culture uh, and the fast moving etc. Uh, uh, world may not have time for that, but those of us who spend time in our gardens, who sp spend time educating ourselves about our connection to the natural world and are living um, in uh, harmony, attempting to, given what we have to work with, um, uh, can, can feel those impulses and, and that energy flowing through us, maybe, which is why the garden calls to me more and more often because I want to feel that energy. Now, what we're getting to is that that key to the kingdom, so to speak, had to be covered up and avoided by the powers that be so as the everyday person couldn't access it, couldn't access those energies. Uh, and, and so we're getting to then and now the more sinister uh, elements we're well aware. And we don't just mean the power structure, but we mean... There was an intellectual counter-revolution, 
against all the chaos of uh, early modernity, the thousands of rebellions, the proletariat takeover, I think it was Milan for 10 days until it was crushed militarily, or the, uh, a feminist movement way before we're told that a feminist movement began, an anti-slavery movement, uh, a popular culture of resistance to all the onslaughts. And that's been covered up, but what happened is when the rulers and the property classes and the intellectuals saw what was happening and they saw that the common enemy, en enemy was magic, they declared a war on magic that they still keep on using. Why do you think the Pentagon is five-sided? That was done consciously. The CIA uses, CIA uses magic all the time, and it works. Um, I've seen it. I've become a witch and, and done magic and observed it. But there was a war against magic, and at the root of mag magic, magic has the same root as mag, of image, mm. of imagination. It's all the same thing. And literally, a man who was very influential on Newton, a man named Henry Moore, wrote a, war, a, a treatise against imagination. And a war was declared. And what they had to do to restore order, they thought, was redefine music. Mm. That's where Bach and uh, all that, the whole Thank musical you. structure got re redone by a man who, theor who theorized, that, a man named Marin Mersenne, who said the purpose of music is to create obedient citizens. And, they and we're the beneficiary of that refinement because we can do things musically, but we also lost a lot. Mm. Language was redefined. It was unfeminized. Figurative language, overuse of metaphors was verboten. Religion was redefined. Dance was redefined. And I was a historian of science studying Newton, and I saw how science was redefined on the basis of the notion that matter was inert. Mm. Inert means dead. Mm. It means you don't do shit unless something from outside you makes you do things. Mm. The model very explicitly written by some of the intellectuals was the worker who only acted according to impulses from outside. Newton wrote his Principia on the basis of that model, and that what became the popular Newton. But the Newton I was studying said, the interaction between colliding particles explains the gross activity of nature. But underneath, we want to know what are the forces inside matter. And for that, he turned to alchemy and alchemy was premised on the notion that matter is everywhere alive. So this counter-revolution totally turned everything topsy-turvy and set us on this course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all these things, these, these uh, banning and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, overturning uh, these ideas, it just sounds uh, terribly familiar uh, to our uh, current situation which is what we're what we're going to address but as you were talking about the um physics of it all i i was reminded um this week uh, we saw the um the passing of the physicist uh, peter higgs right mm. um I, and and the way i understand it is that he he was the one who came up with this uh particle that they shorthand named the god particle and then they, uh, including him, rejected that label. But decades later, he was actually uh, validated in that 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 there is there's some unexplainable things that happen in particle science. <laughs> I'm laughing because secretly, it came out in the researches by uh, by many, including myself, and but others that Newton believed that the basis of gravitation was God. And he couldn't get away with that. He was accused of, of mysticism, but God forbid, 
um, but he believed it. So when they renamed it the God Particle, there was a certain irony there. Right. Because right. it did. It does. Uh, I mean, I once was studying quantum physics, but that was decades ago. But it does seem like a strange creature. Right. So um, I don't know. It was just in the news this week. So it, so it it had me kind of percolating. This is nothing new under the sun. Um, but. Looking at the amazing things that go on that we know about uh, nature, why don't we simply admit that the universe is alive? Yeah. And we're part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It has all the signs of life. Yeah. So um, I, I know that you gave this talk at the um, Howard's End Book Fair late last year that. Uh, that was really well received, which was how, how I came to invite you here to readdress some of these concepts in the book. And that, um, it, it, excitingly, there was a lot of uh, feedback from the people uh, in the room. But it, you want to go ahead and just uh, outline uh, some of what you talked about, and some of, and then we'll get to some of the the solution part of. Uh, of this, uh, we can solve forward. everything in 40 minutes. I hope so. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to focus on today, and what I focused on in the Zen Fair, was our current uh, fight against white supremacy and neo fascism. Because my sense is, you know, we're not doing well. No. And in particular, in the realm of the culture wars, not our terrain. And I know from my studies that fascism and Nazism, both Mussolini and Hitler said, if you think of our movements as political movements, you are missing the picture. Both of them saw themselves, uh, I need water, as both political. Water, here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, right here. Oh, thank you. There you go. As both political and spiritual. And we're redoing this in an orderly fashion, but I like what we're doing. I had a, a chart showing the degree to which the white supremacy groups today and the neo-fascist groups today operate out of a spiritual context in which they are initiated into being skinheads or Aryan nations or Christian identity or branch Davidians. I had a chart with the list of the ones I discovered so far uh, Many of the far right, that's how they see themselves. And what I know is that in Germany, and I think in Italy as well, but in Germany there's testimony that in the realm of culture, the left did not participate. They conceded to the right. And the far right won that war and then won the political war. And we know the disastrous consequences. And the organized left during the 20s and 30s was shackled in that regard, in part because of the Eurocentrism of the commun Communist International, the racism of the Communist International, the insensitivity to uh, crimes against nature of the uh, Communist International, and partly that came out of a convoluted history of Karl Marx. Uh, his militant atheism, which was not a militant atheism, it was a condemnation of Abrahamic religions. It didn't talk about the indigenous religions of the of the uh, uh, of the Americas, which turned out was politically and productively and reproductively significant to all of life. Reproduction, for sure. But the, shaman, the shamans, you know, navigated through, cut that tree. Now's the time to go hunt. Here's this herb to fix this. Here's how to make the childbirth easier. Uh, and Marx, late in life, saw that, but too late to influence the movement because never made his published writings. As a result, he eventually, like Adam Smith, he also looked to Newton as the exemplar of knowledge and how to do things. But he eventually ended up, particularly after the failures of the 1848 uprisings and revolutions, 
picking the mechanical Newton with this dumbass uh, notion of the stage theory. You know, you have to do this before you can do that. Before, As a result, the common turn at a time of massive uprisings in India particular, strikes, armed insurrection, uh, destruction of, of offices, burning of... of uh, a whole rebellion underway when the Comintern met, I think, in uh, 1921 or 20, to discuss world affairs. They gave India five minutes. And Ho Chi Minh had the same critique as a, a man named Roy from India. This is ridiculous, and it was racism and Eurocentrism and mechanism, the belief that you couldn't have a significant uprising until you had your bourgeois democratic revolution. That had to come first, this unit model. <clears throat> anyway, given that, the yeah, what I wanted to do at the Zen Fair was to suggest that we approach the culture wars in a different way, knowing this dumb refusal to engage on that realm. And if the fight for a living planet Sustaining all of us is, is not a spiritual fight. I don't know that that word has any meaning. We're fighting for our survival. Yeah. And it's, it's and so that was the outline I gave, and I broke the attendees into small teams and said, go for it. And they came up with a list of really good ideas, I thought. Well... Yeah, and I mean, let's let's just um, frame it this way. I mean, the the Zinfair called uh, and calls to uh, activists, the engaged uh, public, right? People who are really interested in in forging solutions. And so, I'm uh, guessing that you drew uh, students and longtime, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who who have studied these systems and resisted uh, fascism and are invested in uh, in making this change, right? Um, whether it's environmental or social or political or the the inner work. One of the things that, that struck me, because it came up a couple times uh, on the list, um, and, and, and it's also in the air among activists that, you know, we have to start at home. We have to start with self. We have to start with um, healing ourselves, healing ourselves, and acknowledging that as living, breathing organisms, we do have this spiritual energy that needs nurturing. So we'll just start there, and then uh, more specifically in that realm, um, you know, self-care, care of others, care of neighbor care of you know family neighbor community we start there before we see we have any hope of anything let right? me give you an example Please. that I came up with uh, recently why couldn't a city like San Francisco take some money and engage a mission coalition to send a carnival type thing to Chinatown and have Chinatown do the same thing to the mission and the Bayview mm -hmm. as a way of integrating neighborhoods and integrating cultures with cuisine and dance and music and language and spoken word. That's a great idea. There's so many questions. Why? That, that's can't. what I mean by a culture. Well, it's one sure. example of the culture war. Right. Of a different approach to engagement. Right. Because we are. Um, a segregated city, and as people often acknowledge, um, that uh, Sunday morning, for example, is uh, the the most segre segregated time and day of the week, right? If you go around town, you will see many of us um, segregated, pursuing our Sunday morning activities, mm -hmm. whatever they may be, mm -hmm. right? So, we're talking about w we as a city used to pride ourselves on um, diversity and tolerance. And now we have these segregated parts of the city where the drug addicts 
and the unhoused live, and then the Chinese and Asian American community lives, and the Latino community, right, this is to your point. So for those who don't understand the dynamics of San Francisco and our city government, which is a whole another program, um, yes, we're starting with the basic cultural exchange. Yeah, yeah. And even between countries, you know, I came up with a, <laughs> some of my best ideas started jokes. Uh, a UN resolution that before conflict could actually break out between any two countries, they had to have six months of cultural exchange. And then at the end of that, if you know, they would have, <laughs> I mean, it was just a joke, but right. cultural exchange allows you to understand differences and to go negotiate them and to appreciate them. And uh, humanizes uh, the so-called other, yeah. right? Which is what these other systems and what this uh, encroaching uh, far-right uh, neo-fascist diabolical movement uh, is about is about de dehumanizing yeah. others, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's 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 look at some of these uh, further solutions that um, uh, that your group at the Zinfair. Um, came up with, I, I'm seeing, you know, ancestor reverence, uh, indigenous sovereignty, oral tradition. We can pick up any of these. And, and they discuss. all interrelate. And they interrelate. Yeah. yeah. As the world does. Yeah. Yeah. So well, well, why don't why don't you talk about some of that? And, 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 and who was the constituency there? Uh, and, and did it surprise you? Like, uh, you know, maybe a young person had come up with this, uh, visionary idea much like much like yourself when you were a young person seeing the future I met people who saw it all already uh, uh, a woman who wrote a, had written a novel which I'll recapitulate a lot of the ideas um, there were young people there were older people I I didn't have a chance to talk with them individually enough to get a sense of who they were but as you said there was a self-selected audience at the Zinn Fair um, but I was excited at, at their enthusiasm and how they reconceptualize some of these issues. Yeah. And uh, another thing that you have advocated, actually, as, a, as an organizer with the uh, uh, MAP program in the mission, the, uh, is it bi-monthly? It's, yes. Yeah, bi-monthly performance uh, program that uh, you are often a host of uh, street theater, uh, music, murals. Uh, that's something I know that you're passionate about as a, as a longtime resident of the mission. Um, tell us how that can also enhance our connection. Well, it's funny. Uh, a woman who comes to MAP once said to me, the trouble is MAP isn't a revolutionary organization. And I thought about that for a while. First of all, MAP is uh, about 8 to 10 to 12 different venues bi-monthly that come together and give a series of performances, all free. And the musicians, poets, etc., they didn't get money, so it's art for the sake of beauty, not art as a part of a commodity. And it's every uh, every two months on the even months, first Saturday, and uh, people come out in the hundreds, and it ends up with an after party at my place where people are dancing feverishly, and it's transformative, and it builds community. And building community at this point is revolutionary. Yeah. And, and in the sense of affirming of life and affirming of the commonality, community common. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things uh, that uh, I just happened to fall into. I'm not a creator of it, but I'm one of the organizers of it. Mm. But you are a poet yourself, and uh, sometimes do you share your written words and yes. spoken words? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Um, and, and everyone's welcome, right, to participate yes. Yes. In, in MAP. 
you know, we're not as diverse as we'd like to be, but a, a wide variety of people do come. Yeah. I'd like younger people to get involved. Yeah, so p people can look up more information about um, Mission Arts... And Performance, performance Project. And Performance Project. Project, right. Map, M-A-P-P dot org? I think so. But I think so, too. Yeah, yeah. SF Map. Yeah. Um... Another thing that we discussed, and, you know, it's funny, the last time we talked, we were in the early part of the pandemic, early meaning the first few months, right? And uh, the, no vaccine available at that time, et cetera. Um, and the Mission District in particular, as well as Hunters Point Bayview, were taking the hardest hits citywide. Um, and uh, one of the points that came up at the Zin Fair and community was healing uh, communities, uh, uh, environmental justice, uh, and and how the earth that has been um, abused and not tended to in some of these neighborhoods where folks have felt the brunt of the environmental toxins and whatnot, um, have also begun repairing themselves through community gardens and um, mutual aid and uh, health care that is a kind of on an alternative, more forward-thinking bent. Can you speak to to that a bit or what some of the, the uh, participants brought to the discussion and table on around the realm of health care and healing? There was allusion to it, but not the specifics that we know about. Hunter's Point is a perfect example with a shipyard and the radiation that's buried there, and they want to build. They're building housing there, and uh, and there's a woman uh, whose last name I always butcher, uh, uh, she, um, who writes regularly for the Bayview newspaper. Doctor uh, Sumchai, we've had yeah, her on as yeah, a guest. Yeah, I really admire her work, and when I get some more money, I want to donate some. Uh, great work monitoring this, and yes. On our healing issues, we cannot rely on the broken, perversely broken healthcare system, though we can use it and have to use it. It does have advantages still. Uh, indigenous medicine of a wide variety is, is I'm an herbalist, uh, a lay herbalist. Uh, I treat a lot of people, just simple stuff. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> I have a roommate who just, you know, out of the goodness of her heart, Three times a week, she'll start giving me a, a deep a massage. Just she's a good person, and uh, that type of self-healing and listening to one another. Mm -hmm. We all carry trauma, and we have to share it in a way that's not invasive. And we have a lot of healing to do because capital injures each and every one of us. Injures is, is it maims each and every one of us. Uh, it is a death culture. It is based on extracting from the earth more than the earth has to offer. And we're now facing the in dire implications of that. And the youth know that they're facing this this future. Yeah. I mean, not this future, this present. Yeah. With the, you know, an, uh, another slogan I came up with, but it's also part of the culture war, is an immigration policy that is sensitive to climate justice issues and and economic warfare issues. Yeah. Well, we also heard and, and hear a lot about a world without borders, uh, or at least not a coercive or controlled uh, states where people can freely navigate the earth that is theirs, meaning from south to north <laughs> right yeah i mean borders are absolutely ridiculous with the climate situation and the war situation the west is engaged in horrific wars which create refugees and then it says oh these migrants you know and there are issues to resolve and barriers to and again cultural exchange can be the the oil that that facilitates that motion, uh, but the close off borders and borders are you know in, uh, come with sovereignty, mm -hmm. you know, come with passport, 
being allowed in and being allowed out. Uh, and it's funny, capital does not uh, always have to follow those rules. People do. Right. I guess, you know, not to overlook the uh, obvious uh, here where we live, uh, but another good starting place. We have a lot of starting places, so we have a lot of work that has to be done kind of concurrently, but uh, honoring the treaties, um, that's kind of basic, right? And we are on Ohlone land and hopefully doing honor to Ohlone land and yeah. sovereignty issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I need to keep it really simple in my life and, and, and in my head, you know, um, and so I just try to keep this idea front of mind that I am going to leave my little piece of the earth in better shape than when I found it. That's about the best I can offer at this point. You know, plant some seeds and um, leave it at that. Try not to extract, you know, but rather to uh, enhance. I've been composting since I moved into my house in 77 and the earth is very, very rich. Oh, wow. That's that's beautiful. Um, what else can we offer? I'm seeing, uh, uh, oh, we're talking about all this stuff, monoculture versus diversity, permaculture. Um, uh, I came up with one interest. If monoculture is the death of agriculture, which we know it is, most of us know, or many of us know, what does that say about human culture? Monoculture, right? In the, the death, human realm, the death of yeah. the the species. Yeah, yeah. It's the closing off. Yeah, it's the putting on blinders. Yeah, and as we all know, music is is also the the thing that transmits from culture to culture, species to species. Yeah, yeah. One thing I I I this this jumped out at me because I'm I'm now. Well, I wanted to get back to this other thing of like young people seeing a future but acknowledging that there is death all around them be it from uh new viruses or you know uh, perpetual wars but as we get older we really do have to acknowledge that we lose people there is a grief process it's ongoing right now we're living in perilous times and after a certain age, it just keeps happening, right? So this idea of collective grief and community mourning um, is also part of the the healing, but the acknowledging that there is a passing and then um, this idea of reverence for those who have passed uh, and, and the ancestors who have passed. And um, these seem like, even as I say it, they seem like esoteric practices in some way in our present culture. But there are those of us who take these things very seriously if we are awake, if we are alive, if we are engaged, right? I, I'm gifted to live in the Mission District where because of the uh, strong indigenous presence, the reverence for the ancestors is taken very seriously. And I've tried to work that into my practice to some degree and it makes perfect sense and there's a, a problem there in ancient cultures your ancestors were not only revered but they were buried in the soil you farmed they were part of your life they were part of what you ate with mass migrations from the 18th, you know, the, starting in the 19th century primarily, that gets lost. And so we have to reimagine how that works. If you were, your par grandparents were from Cambodia and you're now living in Bakersfield. And that's, that's a serious spiritual challenge, I think. Mm. But it's very real. Mm. You know, so yeah, reverence for the ancestors, even if they weren't great people, they brought you here. Yeah, yeah. This is interesting, and 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 this is where we, um, we respect others' um, symbols, 
and acknowledgments of such things like altars and icons and things that people erect in the name of this ancestor honoring or worship, so to speak, and um, reverence for the ancestors. I like that word very much. Um, And that um, it shouldn't be foreign to us. And in fact, we can incorporate the best of it into our own life, but appropriation can also, that, that's a, a strange rub, isn't it? It's a very strange rub, and I feel right in the middle of it. You know, what am I doing burning sage, you know, at the beginning of, you know, well, I work with Native Americans, and they I, they burn it when I'm present, and they give me an eagle feather, and I'm not honored enough to have one or to use one, but they gave it to me. What am I supposed to do? And uh, some of my closest friends are part of the sh- that shamanic tradition, and of course I incorporate some of it because I admire it, and it's part of my practice. And I'm not a very good witch, but I've been part of a witchcraft group that fought the, the empire with our sorcery. Um, so if we have these interchanges of culture, a certain amount of blending is not only inevitable, but has to be done respectfully. And it's desirable, Yeah, it, it sounds like. I, I want to go back to something, because it is part of your history, and, it, and it's back there, but it, but it, it's very current, too. When you first came to San Francisco, you said that um, there was a protest that you were engaged in that was like once in a lifetime. You re- remember it. Uh, you you will remember it because it incorporated the you know the usual model for resistance, the marching and the signs and the posters and whatnot. But there was a another element which was more um, along the lines of a magical kind of underground. And this was on the occasion of uh, Three Mile Island, I believe. Um, the one-year anniversary. The one-year anniversary. Tell us a little bit about that march or that um, vigil and um, and how it impressed you. Because it's the merging of the magical with the political. I, um, the night, well, there was a conference at what was New College in San Francisco under the slogan, no nukes is not enough, meaning the anti-nuclear movement had to go beyond that in its analysis and understanding. And I was there, and a woman stood up and proposed some artist thing to put together a protest about Three Mile Island that had happened recently. And she sounded off the wall. I knew her. I didn't trust she would put something together but what she did emerged in this wonderful thing that was organized a lot by Bay Area witches and uh, um, Starhawk being one of them and eventually a woman I was uh, friends with said hey you would I think actually we were dating at that point you would be interested in this and so I started working with the committee and we put together a ritual commemorating Three Mile Island that was a three-mile march, although that was accidental. And it ended up much bigger than it was than it started. And most marches are the opposite. And most marches are deadened by speeches. And we decided no words, just symbols. Uh, we made one exception. There was a veteran of the atomic testing program, a veteran who spoke for atomic survivors, armed armed service people who were purposely put in the path of radiation and were dying of cancer. He was the exception. But um, And we ended with a, the um, sabotage of a cool, uh, the nuclear reactor cooling tower and the release of, I think at that point we didn't know you didn't release balloons. Maybe there were doves, I'm not sure, but it was very moving and very powerful. And through it, I met Starhawk, and eventually we began working together, and uh, we had our uh, coven affinity group in the anti-nuclear movement and did some very powerful work in that. Well, uh, 
I'd say that we see evidence of um, of the the spiritual, although it's not always acknowledged as such. But anytime we have a drummers drumming right at a march, or um, dancers dancing, and uh, you know, uh, and and many of these are ancient traditional rituals that we bring uh, to these modern and again perilous times. I want us to talk a, a bit before uh, before we finish here about this and where are we at? You can tell me. Uh, 10. Oh, great. 10 um, minutes. Great. Um, what, it, <laughs> what are we going to do uh, in this moment of um, encroaching neo-fascism Far rightism, we're still living in white supremacy and uh, misogynistic or patriarchal, um, you know, society. Um, and this is a important year. I don't know if you want to speak to electoral politics, but we could talk about how culturally there could be some movement or shifting in a more productive and positive direction than the one that it would seem to be headed in if, as you say, the left, you know, drops the ball and rejects uh, any kind of cultural engagement. Yeah, I think that's the key terrain that we have to throw ourselves into with, with, with spirit, with gusto, with, with enthusiasm. I mean, uh, the the thing about borders and about diversity. Uh, we have mutual interests with the far right in terms of they are, you know, people who are dispossessed, many of them, and poor, many of them. Yes. And uh, universal free health care. Yes. Supporting small farms. Opposition to factory food. Free education, not based on proficiency, but based on curiosity. Because if you make a ch if not you don't make, if you encourage a child's curiosity, he or she will educate themselves. Because they know that's the way to find out more. You know, things are so ass backwards. With the war against magic, that was declared, you know, we have a whole lot of rethinking to do. Marx thought that you had to critique capitalist society by critiquing its religion. And my argument is based on the role that the science played in creating a new concept of dead matter, inertness, that we have to start with a critique of science and technology which is what my book mm -hmm. is about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd rather focus on the neo-fascist thing rather than my book. Of course, but, you know, it's pertinent to us here in the Bay Area and, and you know, in the shadow of Silicon Valley and you having studied, I mean, you did, after all, attend Caltech and you were uh, in involved in the early years in what became Silicon Valley, and you rejected that. And so what I feel is kind of like a call for folks to reject the status quo and say, no, we're not doing this anymore. We're not going to, we're not into this extractivism, and we're not into this consumerism, and we're not anti, you know, spiritual or, um, you know, all these things that have, it's like, the 60s, these ideas were in the air. And as you point out, and, and, and many you know, uh, people have pointed out, there was the drift away. Uh, and, and as uh, your generation, I'm not pointing fingers, but your generation <laughs> kind of moved, you know, right center or rightward. Some of us. Some of you did, yeah. yes. I, yeah. I, was, I, I think the... Many of the veterans of the Southern struggle, I keep on running into them, and you know, they're still active in some way or other. Yeah. But they're, they're, 
you know, discouraged. And I'm, I feel very uh, grateful that becoming part of the resistance in the late 50s in some, you know, minor way, I was privileged to see the resistance grow from nothing, sort of, to this massive thing that brought the mightiest army in the world it has ever seen to its knees. Not not just us, but in coalition with the Vietnamese and the Parisians and the Spanish, you know, everywhere. It was a worldwide struggle. But we brought imperialism to its knees in Vietnam and colonialism. And the outcome is mixed, but it was a major blow against the colonial engine that the U.S. represented and represents. And so I'm hopeful. I love that. Thank you, because as you said, so many uh, folks are despairing, and and we have to have hope in these times. And there are, you know, all these ways and means to revitalize the deadening. We're not dead yet, but there has this perpetual deadening can be lifted up. And and I want to just thank the activists locally, nationally, internationally, who stay in the fight right and young people especially and elders like yourself who have not given up because uh it means the world to me and it means that that we can pass on this hope and i i wanted to get to that you know this role that um uh older adults can play in sharing skills and passing on knowledge i mean this is what some of us have left this is the work to do in front of us as I see it, um, what can what can you suggest as ways for us to, you know, pass on what we've lived and learned? Uh, Skill sharing in the neighborhood. I mean, bring in the old and the young. I mean, the the, the old love. I read somewhere. I don't know whether it was uh, propaganda or real because in China I, I was getting both but that they paired old people with child care. Yes. yes. Which made perfect sense. Yeah. Inter Pair inter old people with art galleries, with doing making art as mm -hmm. we approach death. How do we conceive of the plastic arts, the musical arts, etc.? Yeah. In we should have art galleries in hospitals that the patients make the art for. Absolutely. Yeah, the intergenerational interactions are really where it's at. Um, and uh, that's another way forward. David Kubrin, thank you for the work that you do in our city, in your neighborhood, at opening your home to artists and activists, uh, and writing this book, Marxism and Witchcraft, which is a lot, I will say, but broken down into these pieces. Um, I, I've I've gained a lot of new wisdom, and and it's time to get to work. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Eric, and thank you. Burden Beckett is one of my favorite bookstores. It's, everyone should know it. And Agreed. thank you, Denise. It's yeah, been thank an you. Honor. We are here uh, when we get here. Um, usually the second Sunday of the month live stream, and um, I'll be back with another uh, great San Franciscan telling their stories of our lives. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Jenna. See you next time.